Expanding World in association with the Explorers Club are proud sponsors of this episode of Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher, and the Global Exploration Summit, a pioneering endeavor bringing together the world's leading explorers, sharing cutting-edge technology and innovations to propel us toward the next frontier in the future of exploration and to make a difference in the future of humanity. Visit GlexSummit.com to learn more about the Global Exploration Summit and the impactful men and women who are the heart and soul of scientific innovation and exploration. One of the things I find most interesting when two explorers get together is we sort of trade stories. This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer, and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. Michael Strandberg is one of the most respected explorers on this planet. And I'm just going to give you a short version of his CV. He has bicycled from Chile to Alaska, from Norway to South Africa. He's gone to Patagonia by horse, Yemen by camel, expedition through Siberia in the dead of winter, spent time in Greenland with his own family. And probably the, the, the toughest expedition he's ever been on was riding a bicycle with me across the George Washington Bridge which goes from New York to New Jersey. Welcome to Life's Tough, but Explorers are Tougher, Michael. How are you? Thank you, Richard. I feel really good to see and hear you again. I'm really good considering the situation really good. So how are you handling uh, the pandemic in Sweden? <laughs> to tell you honestly, it's not like it's been a, a huge change for us here. And I live in Malmö, which is the third biggest city. And obviously you, you can see that actually people, some have put on a mask, otherwise it's pretty much as normal. So normal things, you go to gym, you go to food stores, uh, but you don't socialize as much. So compared to the rest of the world, it's been a, a, a breeze, it, it looked like that. You know, it's interesting if I think of you, and all the difficult expeditions. You've really been through expeditions through extreme heat, extremes, heat, cold, and you've always gotten through with it with, I consider, a sense of humor. You always find irony in life. Are, are you still able to do that? Uh, yes, I, I think so. I, I would say I don't laugh as much as I used to do, and that's because I have two, two daughters, eight and 10, and uh, it is such a huge responsibility being a, a parent. And I'm by myself with the girls. Their mother, she lives in Greenland. So I don't think I laugh as much because I, I worry about these girls. They are doing very well, but for some unknown reason, I just don't laugh as before. I hope to rediscover that though. So uh, are you telling me that being a parent is tougher than being on an expedition in 126 degrees in the shade in Yemen or in Oymyaka in Russia where it's minus 60? Is it is it tougher to sort of handle sort of the psychological dynamics of a family versus being on your own? Well, when we met last time, I didn't have any kids and neither did you. We had five between the two of us. We Luckily, we started late. Otherwise, we would have had 15. I, I agree. I agree. I agree. And, and well, the thing is, I had no idea, Richard, that you could feel so much love for, for human beings. And I, when, you know, they first arrived, I felt love, but for each day passing, I even love them more and more. And now they're kind of growing up and, and it's the best people on earth that you deal with. So I worry for them. 
So we did this bicycle trip, six weeks together uh, this summer, and they've never ridden a bike and, and you know, the chaos initially, the problems were, but they, they, they got a handle on it. And to spend these six weeks together with this lovely, best expedition I've ever done. But I worried more than any of the others. But you have given a leg up to them that most kids I know, where I live in Connecticut, the idea of going on a day trip on bicycle with most uh, kids and their parents is something beyond what they can do. So, you know, for parents out there, how did you lead that expedition? Oh, my, my worries first when we went to the, it's a near park here and they couldn't get up on the bikes, they fell. But they, it seems like they have an attitude that, I, I don't think I had that. They just get up and they get on with it. And they are positive, happy. So we set off and I couldn't cycle behind them or next to them because when I saw how close they were to, to a serious accident, I had to be either, like, like, you know, way in front or behind hoping things would go well. And it did. As quick as you give them the responsibility, they perform. That kids can do this. So they did sixteen hundred kilometers in. You know, it started to, to snow at the end of it. They did better than me. They were in a better mood. I was just cranky and tired all the time. But they did the job. And these times in the tent in the morning and the evening. Uh, I ha I have to take a page out of your parenting because. In America, we have a term called a helicopter parent. They sort of hover or they sort of drop in on every situation to ensure that their kids don't fail. You seem to, you know, sort of grit your teeth, worry, but nevertheless, let them literally fall. Well, you know, it's the, uh, if the thing with life is, the good thing with being an old parent is that you've seen a bit of life. So you realize this is what it takes if you want to have a, as I see it, a, a reasonably good life. You have to live. So even though I'm worried, and I am, as you call it, to a certain degree, a helicopter parent, because I take them to football practice, you know, and I feed them all that. It's not like they do a lot of things. They just got in here and I heard they just threw all the things on the floor and went in for the iPads. So uh, not a big change there, but once we're outside and get going, they, they perform and they love it. That's the thing. They love the outdoors. So one of your um, favorite expeditions that you've done that um, I, I talk about a lot is to Oymyakon, Russia. And the reason I talk about it a lot is that it's the coldest city, I believe, in the world. And when it's cold here in Connecticut, I always in the kitchen go, Alexa, what's the temperature in Oymyakon, Russia? And it's always some crazy, crazy temperature. Actually, in my house, I can hear in the background Alexa giving me the temperature there right now. So it's actually pretty warm today. It's it's only minus 16. That, that sounds good. So tell me about Oymyakon, Russia. I, I have this uh, vision of this brutally cold place. I, and I know uh, where... Uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius uh, intersect is at minus 40. So we're talking about the same things. But I know at minus 40, for example, if you throw a cup of hot uh, water, it freezes well before it hits the ground. And at minus 70, tires actually split from the cold. So how do people live there? Well, the amazing thing is that they actually do live there. And, and uh, so I did this uh, expedition through Siberia for a year and that's how we met but I've been back twice and I've traveled once uh, by the back of a sled with reindeer and that was so much harder than the first trip because I couldn't move I was just stuck at the back of a sled and it was minus 50 well that we I always say minus 50 because the you can't you, how do you measure it that's when where it ends on a thermometer minus 50. So it could have been 60, 65, I have, I have no clue. But it was really cold. And what I learned was, you know, that the original gear of fur and so on is, is so much better when it comes to 
not moving when you're stuck at the back. So I just swapped all the modern gear against that and it worked really well. But it's nothing you, you use when you're skiing. And people, of course, they are used to this. And, you know, they lose the tip of their noses here, you know, all this. And it's kind of part of love and, uh, life. And that's why I love Russia and the cold areas. Their perspective is, is just, it teaches you so much of life. Tell me, what, what did it teach you? Because I, 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 I'm looking at you. I see the tip of your nose. I know you have your fingers. I see your ears. Obviously, you did something. But the idea of losing parts of your body to the cold are very unappealing. So what's, what's the life lesson there? Well, in this case, you know, in many ways, life is so brutal. And, and if, if I look back at Russian history, it's been a lot of drama since the first human being arrived there. And another reason I love Russia is that no matter what, they are so good storytellers. You, whoever, if I go out on the street here in Malmö and stop a person and ask them to tell a story, I'll be bored within two seconds. <laughs> in Russia, you, everyone you meet have the drama of life and they can tell you stories that are just amazing. And the biggest of them all is that they seem to take life as it is. And they, they stick with it, even if it's hard. And at the end of the day, you can sit down and read some Pushkin or whatever you want to do. So, so and that... This happens in, in, in the coldest of weather too. And that's why we went to Greenland. I was hoping to find the same Siberia in Greenland as, as uh, it was there, but it was something completely different. Now I'm gonna g give you a little bit of a, a backstory because I don't know if you realize it, but Greenland was a bit of a real estate scam by the Vikings back in the year 1000 or a little before that, I'm sorry, in uh, the 800s, where they called it Greenland so people would move there. It wasn't really green, and maybe it should have been called Iceland, and Iceland should have been called Greenland. But uh, so you moved there with a, a family. You got married. I got married, and uh, we'd, we were looking for a place so... Pam, she's, what is she, 17, 18 years younger, and she was working on a PhD, and she wanted to do it in Greenland. And I was looking for Siberia, kind of, for the kids. They have to live in, they, they probably need this most extreme nature on earth. And so we moved to a, to a small isolated village called Katsiangwe. It, it, it is actually a town. But, but it's 900 people and, and uh, it was a tough year, hardest in my life, I, I tell you that. The kids did so much better than we, we grown-ups did. So what made it so tough? I mean, isolated for Greenland is isolated because I think of Greenland just right off the bat as isolated. The, the, once you get into a settlement, there, the only way out is by boat, which is impossible in winter, or a helicopter. And you live in this... Uh, you, so you are surrounded by the sea with the most spectacular icebergs. Behind you, you have the ice cap and you can just head off for weeks, nothing. And then in all this, you have a little settlement, which is modern and modern life. A lot of them are out of work uh, and life is harsh and hard. So they are, they're, 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 it is happening things which are tough and brutal for human beings in, in these isolated areas. And, and the family, once the darkness came 24 hours a day, we just couldn't hold it together. But what made you uh, mentioned Oymyakon in, in Siberia, and you sort of paint a little bit of a um, idealistic, I don't know if that's the right word, but you say that there's, they take life as, as, as it comes to them. You're painting a different picture now of Greenland. Is it that your perspective changed once you were married and had kids? Yeah, and I, if you looked at the Siberian time, I was moving from one place to another all the time. So I got all the good sides. People were very happy. Same in Greenland when you first arrived. But when you spend a year there, you kind of get involved in the small daily things of life. And uh, 
if people for some reason do not want anything to do with you, then, you know, it's kind of a very isolated life and Greenlandic is also so much harder than Russian to learn, for example. And of course, perspective as I was there to do a film as well about um, life in Greenland. And of course, you know, uh, my wife, she was fed up suddenly with this uh, old uh, who now it all explorer, which I understand she wanted, this is not what she signed up for. And I understand that. So she decided to, to find a new way of life. And I, I fully respect that it could have been me. It, and we lived in a small house. Uh, the room is not bigger than the one you are sitting in now. That's what we lived in, in darkness with, with Pitarak, this tough wind. And That's a lot of strain. I mean, I think that uh, people talk about cabin fever um, you know, you have, again, been in very tough situations, but, you know, I, I can even look at this myself when I'm with my family, uh, with my kids, you know, the biggest thing is, are the kids happy? Are they adjusted? And then you sort of work it back, uh, to you. It doesn't sound like a lot of your previous expedition training or, or team dynamics worked in that situation. It's a much different dynamic. Well, I, I, to, to, honestly, I think it, it, it did make a difference at the end, all this training I've had. What also happened is in, that just after three months, my daughter turned blind, just like this. So right. that blind, my oldest daughter, Eva, and, and this was a, such a blow to, 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 to life. And uh, I realized it when we were out, I was out trying to teach the girls to climb and she kind of missed her steps all the time. And then I, I thought, what is going on? But of course, nobody could check it. There's not that type of medical care. And somebody said it could probably be cancer. Oh my gosh. So eventually we flew out and it turns out she has a, uh, a lifelong disease called uveitis, which is something which eats the eyes from the back. But we got medicine. She's back in Sweden now. She's cycling. She's a tough little girl. And we didn't know she's had this problem all her life with, with you know, like child rheumatism, which is part of it too. So she, she, she can take any. She's really a tough girl. So well, we learned about that. And in all this, you know, me and Pam split up, though today we are best friends and she's exploring and I'm home with the kids, which is fine. So, I mean, I hate to have you sum up such a dramatic experience, but what did you learn most about yourself in life during this whole process? Life is the way it is. And you just, the quicker you accept that life goes up and down all the time, the easier it will get. And in every situation, try to, to stay positive and, and surround yourself with people who can give you a lot of life, love and support, which, which I got. I had a, 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 some very good friends in the village. And you know, these things happen. So, on the paper, of course, you know, your wife leaves you and all this, finds another man. This is difficult. Of course, it wasn't easy, but I understand it. And it could have been me. It, during these circumstances with your daughter going blind, just chaos. And, uh, you know, we are best friend to, uh, friends today. And she's a wonderful mother and my best friend. But uh, she needs to live her life and I need to live my, so, so it taught me a lot. So I don't get like in the old days, you know, you, you got upset and all this, you know. I'm cool whatever nowadays, thinking, you know, these things happen. That's how it is getting old. You accept things as they are. And what I've learned during this pandemic is we got one chance, live. And that's why what I'm teaching the kids now, take the chance. And that's what we will do. You know, I, I, while it's happening and we've all had bad experiences, 
and no one ever wishes the idea of a child getting sick or a bad marriage or living in, in hostile conditions. But, you know, often I've reflected back on those experiences and I felt that um, I personally have grown. And if you are to go through those experiences, the whole idea is to improve, improve yourself as a person, improve relationships, not take things for granted. And so, you know, I don't think you'll, you're going to look back and laugh at it, but you know what? You're going to say that that was pretty tough, but I'm still standing. And that is pretty tough. I mean, what you've gone through is more than just physical hurt. It is psychological. And the psychological hurt is something that keeps you up at night and sleep deprivation is a horrible thing. You know, when, when we first started this conversation, because behind you, you have a picture of Yemen and 126 degrees and, and Greenland. I was going to ask you what was tougher, but it, it, it seems those are inconsequential to other things in life. They are, you know, the Greenland experience was by far the hardest. And it was, you know, a kind of a summary of what you go through in life all thrown at you in one year. But then having spent so much time on my life traveling, I've seen people who has so much harder times in life and I could put that on my perspective. Okay, so this happened, but we live in Scandinavia medicine is free because this medicine my daughter gets is like seven thousand dollars a month and you know it's not anything we could handle easily anywhere else and so we live here we are privileged so i i, I looked at it like that okay so you know i'm a, an old man who's lost my wife when who hasn't you know, divorce yeah divorces i'm not divorced and i don't plan on it so you can you can Take that idea out of your head. I like being married. Uh, yeah. Well, these things happen, and then you move on with life. As long as you don't become bit, uh, you know, feel sorry for yourself. This is not my style to feel sorry for myself. So no. I just slap in the face. Okay, wake up, Michael. Move on. Do the best you can. And and you still have dreams. You have dreams of other television projects, other expeditions. What's the magic wand? What's the one that you would like to either share with your daughters or go on yourself? You know, Richard, I thought your people told me, you know, 30 years ago, you will, this will get out of your body. It, it's still exactly the same. I want to get out and do things. So on my plate now, I started this after Greenland, I started running. It was the only way for me to, to keep con control of, of the pain. So I ran and I ran and I ran and it became ultra. And, you know, it's been going it's the on. the story of Forrest Gump. You've now just told the story of Forrest Gump. You were the yeah, Swedish Forrest Gump. In a Greenland setting. Uh, and then I, re you know, suddenly I realized this is tough and age and I want to continue. So now I'm looking at longevity, age. How do you become a good elite explorer or an athlete at, at this age? So I'm, I'm training a lot, training harder than ever. So three, four hours average a day uh, with two, two days rest in nine days. So I'm targeting the North Pole the, the proper way. But to, to get to the North Pole, that means me and the girls, since I have nobody looking after them, we have to cycle to the start, which is Katanga, 12,000 kilometers. And we've done a tenth now. So what is the proper way to, I, I skied the last two degrees of the North Pole. So what's, what's the proper way to uh, go to the North Pole? As much as possible, leave, you know, go from land onto ice and ski to the pole without any help. Oof. Which is, of course, not easy nowadays since uh, it's getting less and less ice there. So as it looks like now, one is forced to go in the coldest, darkest time of the year. But I, I, what else can I do? So I wonder, you know, it seems like I could well become the oldest one to do it if that... But it's, it's the journey for me, kind of, with my daughters, and then I, I kind of hopefully do this thing.
But to do that, I want I will cross the ice cap of Greenland next year. And it's with ten year olds. No, they are not. No, no, they are not coming on the ice cap. Or, but they will cycle with me to Katanga to the start. Yes. Wow, that is tough. And so you're. I mean, I guess you you have some inner drive or philosophy about growing old in in and being an explorer. It sounds like you're going to leave it all out on the field. Well, what else to do? You've had this life. You know where the bar is set about living. I don't want anything else. I cannot do anything else. And to be able to survive in these days, you know, like a white middle-aged man, there's not a lot of opportunity. So I will continue to do this because I'm still very curious on other human beings. And I just enjoy this harsh, brutal life. It's... I have no idea why, no idea why. And who knows, I might meet uh, the woman of my life out there. I, I was gonna ask you, you know, that question too. So you're open to still going high octane adventures, meeting the love of your life, raising kids. I, I think this is a great second act. I mean, if I, I think, as you said, all of it is the journey, the journey to where you're going whether it be meeting that that person or raising children or an adventure, it's it's really the journey. Somehow, once you get there, it's a little anticlimactic. It is. You know, another thing you learn, of course, is to enjoy every day on route, both the difficult and, and the easy days. And being out with, with my daughters as I have it, it's the most fulfilling time of my life to see their happiness or they are part of this life. They turn up next to you and ask, how are you doing, dad? You look tired because they want to tease me all the time. And uh, when you see they bloom out, they love people, they meet. It's, it's a privileged life too, because the only people they meet are other people who want, oh, who are these girls who are doing? Because they create a lot of attention when these two little girls with a lot of gear on their bikes turn up like nothing has happened. So they, and they like the attention they get, uh, you know, here they come, the Strandberg daughters, they like it a lot that they want more of that. The older one with the eye disease, she doesn't care about these things, but Dana, she, she likes it. She wants to be in the center of attention. So it, it has a bit of everything. Most of all, we get tighter as, dad and daughters and and the love we feel for each other is just enormous my my point of view i guess they could say something else you know michael i, I think that and we only have a minute or so left but the greatest expedition that you and i and we haven't done it together has been parenthood raising kids being active with them being part of their life uh feeling satisfaction from that and that's that's something to be very proud of. That makes you, in, in my book, a very rich man. I agree very much. And I just realized you climbed Kilimanjaro. How old were you? I, I was 11, and I wouldn't do it with my kids. Uh, I, I don't, they, they need snacks every 10 minutes. So uh, <laughs> you've been, a, you've been a, a more of a taskmaster than I have. I'm feeding them something every 10 minutes. These huge costs of the expedition one have that because you have to feed them all the time, keep them happy, cookies, sweets. You do things that you're not allowed to do, but so you, you know, you say, if you do it today, you might get McDonald's or something in the <laughs> evening. They do it. You, what, what can you, that's life. You have to take away these things which might be important to you that is not right or wrong. But if, if it makes them happy, you do it. You know, I started this um, broadcast by saying that you're one of the most respected explorers I know. And, and that respect for you continues. But you're also one of the toughest guys and have one of the biggest hearts. You know, scratch the surface of Michael Strandberg and you'll find a huge heart. Michael, thank you for being on Life's Tough, but Explorers are Tougher. You're a tough guy. I feel honored indeed. You almost made me cry now. Those were nice, nice words, Richard. Thank you. You're welcome.